Hello everyone, I'd like to welcome you to this informal workshop exploring some of the themes and ideas emerging from the Breaking the Mould Sculpture by Women since 1945 exhibition. This new Arts Council Collection Touring exhibition will launch at Longside Gallery at Yorkshire Sculpture Park on the 29th of May. My name is Natalie Rudd and I'm the Senior Curator of the Arts Council Collection. I'd like to thank Dr Claire Jones at the University of Birmingham and everyone at the Association for Art History for providing this platform to showcase the exhibition as part of this conference. And I'd like to introduce this very esteemed panel. Firstly, Bianca Chu. Bianca Chu is an independent curator, consultant, strategic advisor and a representative of the Kim Lim Estate in London. Born in New York, Bianca previously worked in the commercial arts sector for nearly a decade first at Christie's and then at Sotheby's, where she was Deputy Director of S2 Gallery, the exhibition arm of the auction house. There she co-curated over 20 exhibitions, including two on Kim Lim in 2017 and 2018, which was accompanied by the first monographic publication by the On The Artist. She's also the co-chair of the Tate Young Patrons and is currently completing a Master's in Material and Visual Culture in the Department of Anthropology at UCL. Bianca holds a Master's of Arts from the University of Edinburgh in History of Art and Chinese Studies and her research currently focuses on a variety of subjects including Asian diaspora artists, cultural memory, perceived marginalised art histories, artists estates and the international art market. Welcome to Bianca. Dr Abby Shapiro is Assistant Curator at the Hepworth Wakefield and a lecturer at the University of York. Her academic and curatorial research explores the legacies of female artists, collectors and dealers in post-war art histories and public art collections. She's currently working on the major retrospective Barbara Hepworth Art and Life opening at the Hepworth Wakefield this May and a book chapter for UCL Press about the relationship between women artists writing and autobiographical art. Great to have you here, Abby. And finally, Sarah Turner. Dr Sarah Turner is an art historian, curator and writer. She's Deputy Director for Research at the Paul Mellon Centre for Studies in British Art in London, which is part of Yale University. And she's taught art history at the University of York and at the Courtauld Institute of Art. Sarah is a Fellow of the Royal Society of Arts and she is co-editor of British Art Studies, an award-winning digital arts publication, and the co-writer and co-host of the wonderful Sculpting Lives podcast series. She co-leads the London Asia Project with Hamad Nasser and they're currently working together with Amy Tobin to develop an exhibition about Lee Huan Chia and Winifred Nicholson. And she's recently, recently written essays for exhibition catalogues on Rana Begum, Linda and Eileen Hogan. And you can find a full list of Sarah's work on the Paul Mellon Centre website. Following my brief introduction to the exhibition, we're going to make three journeys into the exhibition by focusing on three artist practices. Abby will consider the work of Barbara Hepworth, Bianca will discuss Kim Lim's work and Sarah will explore the work of Veronica Ryan. And through this process we hope to reflect upon some of the wider issues facing women working in sculpture, particularly those surrounding patronage, market forces, market forces and legacy building. This is an informal and exploratory session and we really welcome your thoughts, questions and feedback. So please do not hesitate to contribute to the chat at any stage and we will take as many questions as we can at the end, towards the end of the session. So to begin, Breaking the Mould, Sculpture by Women since 1945 is the first survey of post-war British sculpture by women in a public institution. All of the works in the show are from the Arts Council collection and 50 artists are represented. The exhibition is going to tour all across the UK during the next sort of two years. And the Arts Council collection was formed in 1946. It's the largest loan collection of British art in the world. We're essentially a library of artworks designed to be borrowed and toured. We've got over eight and a half thousand works by nearly 2000 artists. And this collection continues to grow through acquisitions and a changing panel of external acquisition panel members joins us on a rotating basis to ensure that new voices are entering into the collection. The collection is notable for the strength of its sculpture with over a thousand works. And of these approximately 260 are by women, so just over a quarter. We've got an excellent range of practices spanning 75 years and this year is our 75th anniversary. However, of these sculptures by women, only 30% have been seen during the past 10 years. 
want to just give a very, very brief overview of the shape of our holdings. And it's intriguing that the very first work by a sculptor to be acquired for the collection was this drawing by Barbara Hepworth called Reconstruction. And the very first sculpture to be acquired for the Arts Council collection was this piece by Car Karen Johnson, seated nude in 1951. So it's interesting that sculpture by women was present at the very beginning of the Arts Council collection. I think it's fair to say that the um, acquisition of sculpture by women grows slowly but steadily from this point onwards, but it's only really in the late 1970s that things start to really pick up pace. And my sense is that this is because of the diversification of the acquisitions committee. And I think this leads to pretty instant and lasting improvements in terms of greater diversity of sculpture acquisitions. We have Sheila Wakeley, sculptor, Lynn Cook, critic, Sonia Boyce and Alison Wilding, artists, all contributing to the process of decision making during the early 1980s. And you can see instantly that suddenly there are many works entering the collection by women and by a diverse range of artists working in the UK. There have been many positive headlines in recent years regarding acquisitions. In 2017 to 2018, more work by women than men was acquired for the first time in the Arts Council collection's history. And in 2018 to 2019, all of the external members were female. Increasingly, as with this work by Helen Martin, we need to seek external funding to be able to invest in the work of uh, major artists and uh, major uh, sculpture by women. And we also invested in this work by Phila de Barlow, but I think it's important not to be too self-congratulatory. For example, this work we acquired in 2016, despite Phila de having contributed to British sculpture for many decades previous to this. So where did this project come from? Well, in 2016, I met with Dr. Catherine George at Coventry University and Hilary Gresty, independent curator. And Catherine and Hilary told me about their research project, Women Working in Sculpture from 1960 to the Present Day Towards a New Lexicon. And this involved extensive conversations with sculptors at different stages in their careers. They wanted to look intergenerationally to investigate shared experience with an overriding desire not to ghettoize. It immediately became clear that there was an incredible opportunity to delve deeper into the holdings of the collection and thus the idea for an exhibition took hold. And the selection of the show came about through a process of collective conversation with myself, Catherine, Hillary and with our tour partners. And making the selection was really difficult because we knew that we couldn't represent everybody. We discussed at length the issues of women only exhibitions, but when it came to viewing such extensive holdings, we came to the decision that we wanted to show as much of this work as we could and to pursue the notion of a curatorial corrective and to counter many exhibitions and narratives which had excluded the work of women altogether. Avoiding a chronology was one way of acknowledging that there's no fixed story to tell. We wanted to evidence a multiplicity of voices, experiences, breakthroughs, innovations. So we opted for a gentle thematic approach rather than a chronological overview. And this has enabled intergenerational and intersectional conversations across works and practices. So the three, the three themes are figured, which looks at uh, figurative influences, formed, which looks at more formal influences, and also found, which looks at a very strong impulse around found and salvaged objects such as this piece where Rachel White Reed explores the spaces found beneath domestic chairs. But overall, we wanted the exhibition to be as open as we could make it, acknowledging concurrent interrogations of um, binary definitions of gender and seeing the show as one of a number of initiatives designed to increase representation within the discourses of sculpture. So we've been installing the exhibition even today. We were just working on Philida's show today. Um, which is really exciting and it's been wonderful to see the works in the space after a year of postponement and it's been surprising how many correspondences have jumped out at us which we hadn't anticipated. And these pictures don't really do justice because we've only really completed the small scale works but the, what, seeing the large scale works together in the space is really powerful. And I'm drawn to the considerable number of works that employ precarious materials or salvage processes as a deliberate strategy. There are dying flowers, salvage blankets, stuffed tights, and the cast remains of absent spaces. And my sense is that these approaches to materiality have substantially transformed the causes of British sculpture. 
I think another recurring theme within this exhibition is one of overcoming challenges and being resilient. So there are many stories of art schools such as Jan Howarth who faced overt sexism and so decided to start using deliberately fem so-called feminine materials such as sequins and latex thus eliminating male competition. And Villa de Barlow has similar stories to tell around her experiences at art school working uh, under the tutorage of Reg Butler. Um, but also, many of the artists had very limited means, so scavenging becomes important, such as this work by Veronica Ryan, made using old blankets found on the streets. So this discovery enables her to work on a larger scale. So sometimes challenges create opportunities and it's been really interesting to see this theme emerge throughout the exhibition. So I'm really kind of inspired by this idea of perseverance and resilience that's really shining through. So just finally to end in terms of next steps, um, I think there are still many challenges still to face and maybe that will come out in the conversation later but still younger artists feeling that it's difficult to take those first steps after art school still artists having challenges working alongside parenting and also about sustaining a career longer time in a longer term into older age there's also so much that we don't know many careers open for research many artworks without an image or a text on collection website including the arts council collection website um, so I really feel very strongly that breaking the mould is not just a one-off project, it's not just an exhibition, but it's more an opportunity to initiate a wider set of actions to increase visibility across all of our holdings, you know, proactive digitisation, interpretation and lending of a, a diverse range of sculpture beyond the usual suspects. And this is an ongoing strategy which we intend to pursue during the course of this exhibition and beyond. Thank you very much. I'm gonna hand over to Abby. Great, thank you, uh, Natalie. If you could bring up the first slide, which will help visual aid. Thank you, great. Um, well, thanks so much for the invitation to speak. Um, I mean, I think breaking the mold raises so many interesting questions about the visibility of women in our public collections um, and how we address that. And, and it's really great to be here to talk about it. Um, but to talk about Barbara Hepworth is, I think she's such an interesting figure in this regard, because I suppose on the one hand, Hepworth has managed to secure um, a very visible place in 20th century British sculpture. Her her legacy hasn't been uh, marginalized perhaps in the same way that other women um, in these histories and, and in this exhibition um, might have been compared to their male peers particularly. Um, and, and I think it's a case in point that I work for a gallery dedicated to her legacy. So that sort of tells us something about the kind of nature of her stature here. But um, nevertheless, I think it is really important to sort of scrutinize and, and think further about how Hepworth's career um, and her artwork have been positioned within these histories, how they continue to be sort of malleable and, and, and sort of change in the way that she is presented. Um, and, and she has been presented tokenistically in the past as kind of, you know, this sort of single um, female sculptor in a, in a wider exhibition. So rather than thinking about the invisibility um, of female sculptors, Hepworth Legacy sort of offers up something interesting to think about what it means to be extra visible, um, perhaps as a female sculptor, um, especially as one of the few in these kind of male driven narratives. So something I thought I would touch on a bit is a kind of question of biography um, and interpretation, which I expect we'll, we'll have lots more to say about um, going on. So um, as many of you will know, during her, her life, Hepworth sort of did deal with these kind of quite gendered issues um, and she was very aware of, of how her work was was not only being gendered sometimes in the press and kind of you know language around um, how her work was described um, but actually in her private writing and in her letter writing um, with with friends she often reflected on being at a disadvantage um, because of being a working mother and um, sort of being be torn between these two different forms of labor so between carving and childcare. 
And I think it's really important for Hepworth to foreground that she, she didn't shy away from actually exploring these themes in, in her work. Um, her formal language of abstraction, I think, was in fact and, and very arguably indebted to her experience as a mother. Um, so this work that you um, have in the exhibition, um, Icon um, from 1957, is quite an interesting piece in this regard and, and in her oeuvre in relation um, to this idea of biography, um, because we often um, frame Hepworth as an abstract artist expressing these kind of universal relationships between figure and the landscape. Um, but autobiography and gender were really important and, and ingrained in her work. So this carving was made following a trip to Greece, which is often sort of held to be this very pivotal trip for her, where she's discovering sort of landscape forms and, and kind of evolving um, her kind of formal language. But this trip was also um, Sort of happening at exactly the same time where she was grieving after her first uh, born child had had died in a plane accident and so i think you know it's important to kind of you know sort of piece together and think about how this exploration of form is also underpinned um by a process of grief um, and mourning so if we could go to the next slide um please so I wanted to just, you know, sort of uh, acknowledge that Hepworth dealt with these um, themes, uh, this maternal theme really throughout her career, right from the 1930s, right up until the 1970s. And the work that you can see here, which is um, the one that's bang in the center, um, Child with Mother, was made um, indeed towards the end of her life. Um, and we, I just wanted to, to show this image because this work um, just recently came off display, but it's been in dialogue with Kim Lim's sculpture which is on the uh, far uh, right there um, and and just to show the sort of uh, way in which we were thinking about the formal resonances um, between the two artists work and the mutual ways that both women um, express abstract relationships between nature nurture and the figure so if we could go back to icon please natalie thank you um, so i think it's it's really important important to start asking these kinds of questions about the way art made by women is refracted through bio biographical lenses um, in exhibitions and really thinking about biographical interpretation the way it's being used in in different contexts so the way biographical interpretation was happening over the last half century and and also how and why we're using it today um, because i think sometimes you know we're trying to sort of overlay sometimes too much biographical interpretation onto um, the meaning of an object whereas in fact i think today it's actually more interesting to think about the conditions of production biographies telling us something about how the work was made and, and especially in the case of women it helps us understand the limits um, women were facing particularly women of color um, in their access to education to pay to resources to childcare, um, and to status um, so just to briefly touch on the fact that the work that we do at the Hepworth tries to think about Hepworth's legacy in these quite expansive ways. We try to take into account that we're not just thinking about her career, but we're thinking about the space that she created, the space her legacy has kind of left left in its wake um, and how that's kind of created space for um, established and emerging sculptors um, to come up in its wake and then I just wanted to really briefly plug the show but it really sort of fits with with this and I'm so delighted that these two shows are going to be running um, concurrently so we're, we're just in the midst of hanging um, this major retrospective. It's the first retrospective of Hepworth in quite some time um, to coincide with the 10th birthday um, of the museum itself. And um, lead curator Eleanor Clayton has written a really fantastic biography of Hepworth instead of a catalogue. Um, I mean, it, it accompanies the exhibition, but she's written a really extraordinary biography using a number of kind of archival materials and private letters that haven't been um, shown before. And I, and I think this is just indicative of a moment where um, not only do we have a museum dedicated to a, a female sculptor, but we're, we're having an exhibition um, that can then really quite comfortably justify um, this kind of relationship between art and life. So we're not having to kind of um, justify this explicitly as a feminist strategy in quite the same way as I think we have been for a really long time. Um, but in fact, you know, it's kind of integrating the personal has become a much more acceptive um, strategy um, of interpretation. So yeah, fantastic that these shows are going to be on at the same time. I think it's a really um, exciting moment to be to be having these conversations. So I'm going to uh, hand over to Bianca. 
Thanks, Abby. Um, and uh, thank you, Natalie, as, as well, for inviting me to speak on the on the workshop. Um, so for my section on Kim Lim, could I have the next slide, Natalie? Um, I'll be discussing very briefly the three works held in the Arts Council collection, starting with Samurai 1961, which will be included in Breaking the Mold. Um, I'll be showing a few images as well from the archive of the estate, and at Natalie's request, speak a little bit about my commercial experience in relation to the two shows of Kim Lim at S2 uh, in, in 2017 and 2018. Uh, so it's worth noting that the Arts Council went back three times to acquire Kim Lim's work between the years 1962 and 1982. Uh, Natalie, in a, in a discussion we had, also explained to me that this was a relatively unusual occurrence. Um, so her representation within the Arts Council collection shows a depth and wide-ranging engagement with various materials that Kim worked in. Um, interestingly, all the works um, in the Arts Council collection have been displayed and loaned since the moment of acquisition. Um, and as, as the focus of the workshop is also to consider the role of women specifically, I think it's worth pointing out that there were no women invited as external members of the Arts Council Acquisition Committees until 1979. Um, so Samurai here was acquired in 62, the year after it was made, um, and is a prime example of Kim Lim's early period and her carving with and on wood. Carving is the key action to consider in relation to her practice, um, and this is visibly and excellently discussed and presented in the current Tate Britain collection display curated by Elena Kripa. Um, I'll be discussing the recurrent title and motif of Samurai towards the end of the presentation. Could I have the next slide, please? Uh, so this is Candy from 1965, and it was acquired in 67 by the Arts Council. Here we can see a shift from using natural wood toward an, an even greater experimentation with the formal language and a shift towards color. Um, so in an interview from 68 with Jean Barrow, then at the ICA, uh, Kim described her process after leaving the Slade, and I'm going to quote her here. The elements in the sculptures grew in dimension, size rather than scale, at first so that the obvious material to use became laminated blockboard. Natural logs were too small for the areas I wanted to cover. At this point, the forms became flatter, and candy is a fair example of these interests. Um, and I think it's just nice to note uh, Kim's sort of apprehension, even talking about her own work um, at that time. Uh, could I have the next slide, please? So some of my favorite images in the archive uh, are these series of images taken by Kim of works in her studio. Um, so the one on the left appears more formal, uh, perhaps even more, a more curated display um, of all her works at the time. And it's worth noting the hanging prints and drawings that background her sculptures. Um, her process in two dimensions and three dimensions were co-constitutive and neither was privileged above the other. And this is a really important point to make. Um, sometimes her sculptures would inform her prints and of course, vice versa. Um, and actually here you can see Candy in both of the images as well. Um, next slide, please. The third and latest work in the Arts Council collection is Trace 2 from 1982, and it was acquired the same year that it was exhibited in Nicola Jacobs Gallery. Here we have a really beautiful example of Lim's stone work, which began after 1979 upon seeing all of her work in her first major survey show at the Roundhouse that year. It's kind of interesting to think of 79 in relation to the year that the Arts Council first initiated women in their external committees, the year of the Roundhouse exhibition, the year of uh, the Hayward Annual as well. Um, so kind of a watershed year in relation to chronology. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so on this uh, slide, I wanted to show Trace 2 in situ, so you can see it in the uh, top uh, right corner. Um, Lim had already had three exhibitions with Jacobs between 79 and, and 82, um, and I wanted to point out three works that were also included in the S2 exhibition that I co-curated in 2018. Column, which is uh, on the left, um, Flow, which is at the very back, which is tiny, but it's a kind of, it looks like a, a, a series of steps. Um, and uh, and Gobi, all of which, and that's the the piece on the wall, the small image, um, all of which were sold during the exhibition to collections in the UK, the US, and Asia, indicating a truly global interest and affinity with Lim's practice at the moment, um, at that time and now. Um, our exhibition in 2018 and the smaller show we organized uh, the year before of only 70s woodworks were well received. And the purpose of pointing this out is just to note that with the exception of the 2014 exhibition at the New Art Centre in Roche Court, Lim's work had not been seen within the public realm and not in London since 1999, which was her last major presentation of work and a posthumous show at the Camden Art Centre. 
So it's 20 years. It's almost essentially a 20 year period of relative in invisibility of Kim's practice. Um, the engagement we had from the 2018 S2 show exceeded our expectations. Of course, we had hoped that this kind of exhibition would garner a rediscovery of sorts, and that's a problematic term, pointing that out, within the mainstream art world and market. But what actually occurred was kind of relatively noteworthy. It's nothing new for commercial galleries to constantly be on the lookout for underrepresented and undervalued artists. And this is something that has happened for decades. However, in the case of the S2, which was the exhibition of Sotheby's that closed in May last year during the pandemic and when I left the auction house, Darren Leake, who was the director, and I were given a rare opportunity to then, then at the time, to mobilize resources of the auction house, essentially a commercial instrument, to promote artists that for one reason or another had been perceived as sidelined or placed on the periphery of the market and quote unquote established fields of the art world. In a way, yes, perhaps this gave the show an added gravitas by the simple association with Sotheby's, but more importantly, it permitted us the space to be innovative in a sector where innovation remains pretty meek and possibly afforded for a context that was unusual and unexpected, which I think is necessary when attempting to recontextualize an artist out of their time. Institutions and galleries still remain the most agile forums for this and with, with their own unique advantages and disadvantages, of course. For a time, our goals were aligned with management at Sotheby's, and in the sense, there was an optimism about breaking down perceived ideas of what an auction house could do with its resources. In the case of Kim Lim, to be able to highlight her work in a different context and bring it to a London audience again, where she lived and worked. However, whether it is possible to truly be critical and experimental at auction houses in relation to a shared space that is both market driven and art historically exploratory, for me remains a fundamentally contradictory question that likely won't be answered. And in my opinion, this gap is only widening. Next slide. Thanks. Um, so this is my last slide, and I just wanted to provide a visual and formal connection between different aspects of Lim's practice and to highlight the recurrent engagement with the concept of samurai. Um, the title samurai was given to three different works um, of a similar period. So one, two from 1961, which is the Arts Council piece, as well as the piece, um, the, the bronze in the bottom left corner, and one from 64, which is the steel piece in the top left. Um, so uh, here we have the three different materials as well, wood, steel, and bronze. So she's privileging the conceptual meaning of samurai, um, which is a term referring to a warrior caste within feudal Japan from 12th century until their abolition in the 1870s. So Kim was incredibly liberal and generous in regards to her engagement with her Asian heritage. And this was clearly informed by her travels all over East and South Asia. When asked if she was, quote, particularly related to Chinese art, being Chinese or to the art of the Orient, which of course is, again, this terminology is reflecting its outmodedness, um, asked by Barrow in the same interview from 68, her reply was, not Chinese art specifically, but I have a great empathy for Eastern art of the past, for instance, to the nonverbal experience of the Zen garden. And she went on to explain, this is where I'm gonna end, um, that I prefer an art that has quietude and containment. Sculpture of all times and societies deal with many of the same basic issues and shares attitudes or declares quite opposite positions about such matters as the relationship of space and mass. The obvious differences, subject matter and superficial treatment often hide important similarities and sympathies. For me, the experience of sculpture East and West taught me what sculpture is about. Experience gave me the motive to go on. Thanks. And I will now pass to Sarah. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks, Natalie, for the invite. And it's a real honor to be uh, speaking with you and Bianca and Abby this evening. I'm going to briefly speak to the work of Veronica Ryan, who, an artist who, as Natalie's already mentioned, um, features in the Breaking the Mold exhibition represented by her bronze and plaster sculpture Territorial, made in 1986 and purchased in 1987. Ryan's visual language often draws on the natural world using seed pods and the structures and forms of plants, fruit and geological phenomena to make work which speaks both of personal memories and the universal forces of nature that shape and structure the material world we live in. The title of this work, Territorial, prompts us also to think about the landscape and territories as sculptural work like this inhabits. 
Without a plinth, it spreads out its bronze petal-like trumpet form towards the feet of the viewer, inhabiting our space physically and psychologically. The territories of sculpture and how Ryan, as a woman born on the Caribbean island of Montserrat, who moved to Britain, aged only 18 months with her family, has operated in, through, across, and even against the histories of British sculpture is perhaps something we could return to later in our discussion. Ryan will also be the subject of one of the episodes of Sculpting Lives, the podcast, um, as Natalie's mentioned, that I co-host with Joe Baring, the director of the Ingram Collection. And the podcast explores the lives and careers of women who have contributed in groundbreaking ways to the histories of sculpture. In the first series, we, hit, we featured episodes on Barbara Hepworth, Elizabeth Frink, Kim Lim, featuring an interview with Bianca, uh, Phila DiBarlo and Rana Begum. And the second series is currently in production and we're planning episodes on Dora Gordeen, Gertrude Hermes, Veronica Ryan, Alison Wilding, Anthea Hamilton, and one focusing on public statues and monuments featuring a range of artists and projects. And you can find the podcast via the Paul Mellon Centre web website and all your usual podcast platforms. And each of those episodes takes a woman sculptor as its subject exploring the artworks, networks, connections and relationships which the, of these artists. And every episode is recorded in places that are significant for these women, their studios as well as galleries and public places in which their work is on display. And through the podcast, we, we create these kind of what we hope are intimate soundscapes of private and public worlds of sculpture. That sense of dialogue or of building up a conversation, which is intergenerational, whilst being historically specific, but also takes a longer view of some of the issues um, encountered by women artists across generations, has been important and insightful for, for Joe Baring and I we've, as we've recorded Sculpting Lives. But I think it's something that's also in play in the Breaking the Mould exhibition, as I've only seen it through the catalogue and from talking to Natalie. Um, and I think it's also at play in the, the presentations we've already heard um, this evening. Speaking to the past and to history through sculpture and as a sculptor is specifically an idea which Ryan has engaged with in her work. Nathalie, could I have the next slide, please? Um, Ryan made Mango reliquary in, um, while she was an artist in residence at Tate's and Ives between uh, 1998 and 2000. And she was asked to respond to the work of Barbara Hepworth um, while she was there in, in St Ives. And she worked in um, Hepworth's studio using marble, which had been donated by the Hepworth estate. And this was all marble that Hepworth herself was working on just before she uh, died. And I think the sarcophagus forms of these blocks is surely significant. Soon after Ryan was working, um, in, invited to work in St Ives, one of um, Montserrat's many volcanoes um, erupted, covering the, or the southern part of the island in ash. Um, and I think this idea of destruction, of regeneration, is something that comes up again and again um, in her work. This is not, I don't think, a reliquary for or about Hepworth and her practice but it's a conversation about the acts of commemoration that so much of sculpture performs. Through a series of juxtaposition of forms and ideas, like mangoes in St Ives, or the soft, malleable, dark lead pressed into the hard white uh, marble, Ryan forces our attention on the materiality of sculptural language and asks us how art objects construct meaning. And this is a conversation of form and process. And I think it's a conversation which Ryan definitely is not uh, finished with. And uh, she's been commissioned to make a new work for the Barbara Hepworth retrospective at the Hepworth Wakefield, uh, responding to the influence of Hepworth on her practice and the natural forms in Hepworth's garden. Can I have the next slide, um, Natalie? And I'll, I'll, I'll wrap it up so we've got some time for questions as well. But I think a key question for us to think about is how exhibitions and the exhibitions and, and the commissions that are often associated with them intervene and shape art histories. Exhibitions are of course public stages where artworks meet publics and they are places where narratives are formed and reformed. 
So how can a sculpture intervene, disrupt and challenge its own often troubled histories? And I think, again, this is a question that Ryan's explored through various exhibitions and her uh, solo show, which will open in Spike Island in Bristol um, in May, I think will also um, ponder some of those questions. So I'll, I'll, there's so much more to say about her work, but I'll wrap up there because I know we want to have a conversation uh, between ourselves and with the audience as well. Thank you so much, Sarah, Bianca and Abby. It was wonderful to have your insights there. Um, I think we've got some time left for questions. I'm just going to uh, you please add your questions to the chat. I think we should get going straight away. One of the things that strikes me really clearly is this idea of presence and absence. Artists still with us, artists no longer with us, this idea of sort of chattering conversations across time. And I wanted to start by asking, perhaps Bianca and Abby, what have been the challenges of building an artist's legacy and memory when the artist is no longer present to shape that vision? Shall, shall I start? Yeah. Okay. Um, so I, I guess I can speak to more about the specifics of the Kim Lim experience or the experience I have working with the estate. Um, in some ways, in this case, we're really fortunate because Alex and Johnny Turnbull, who are Kim's sons, um, had time with their mother. Um, of course, they were not wearing their hats as custodians of her work and legacy during their lifetime, but so much of the positioning and approach we've taken has come from their personal and shared experiences of being around her in her studio and talking to her. Um, they also have the extra experience of their father, William Turnbull's estate, which had a more transitional period um, uh, when he was still alive. I think one of the biggest challenges facing any estate and is the central concern for us is the preservation and maintaining of uh, integrity. And the and, and and acting and working in accordance with the artist wishes. So this is something that we discuss often, almost as like a self-reflexive practice. Um, both because both Bill and Kim were active at a time when being an artist wasn't necessarily as celebrated as it is today. They did it. They were artists um, despite this, and irrespective of their social context and conditions they were present in. Um, another challenge is is really the entanglement of various questions of authority and rarity and scarcity that emerge with the management of an estate. Um, so in the case of the Kim Lim estate, much of the work still remains with, with the estate, but we're also acutely aware that there is a limited body of work due to her untimely passing. Um, as such, it's really important that we build strategies around um, placement, acquisition, exposure, and eventually long-term legacy planning. And also practicalities such as inventory management, provenance research, the archive, and archival conservation and digitization. Um, so for some estates, they're marred as well by questions of authenticity, which we don't really have this, what well, hasn't emerged so much for us. Um, usually this is for older estates or modern or post-war, and perhaps Abby can speak to that uh, more, um, that have become incredibly valuable. And this emerges through all kinds of webs of, tangled webs of agendas and politics, which there could be an entire workshop on its own about. Um, so it's really kind of thinking about how best to manage assets versus currency, cash strategically to ensure that the work of the estate is prolonged as well. Um, and of course, there are other many, many other challenges related to representation, reproduction, display and so forth. But I think I will end on there. <laughs> Um, I guess I'm going to take a slightly different approach to that. Um, I get, I'm just thinking how much, how important I think my understanding of Hepworth's legacy um, is is iterative. You know how it changes over time, and and it's been really interesting um, being involved with this exhibition and seeing different ways in which her work's been displayed at major. Um, you know, Tate has had big shows and 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 hold a lot of her work and in fact take hold her the bulk of her of her archives there we have a different set of archives at, at the museum at the Hepworth Wakefield um so it, it's interesting to see how these things change and I think it's important that they change I don't think we're one version of an artist or there's one presentation of their legacy and and with someone like Hepworth you know who has had these kind of really interesting different ways in which um, her stories her works uh, contexts that she's been presented in and you know maybe touching on what Bianca was saying I think 
you know, when there is a, an estate very involved, you know, these things again will change over time. The more, you know, custodianship and and collections and and dealers and, and all kinds of things kind of, you know, they pass through different hands, they're shown in different contexts. So I guess that's what I was touching on in my presentation. This our exhibition is one snapshot in time of where we are today culturally with the presentation of Hepworth. And I think that's what's so interesting about your show, Natalie, is it's also a presentation in time of where we are with the need to talk about um the legacies of female sculptors and that we do still perhaps need um these these kind of women only shows um in order to kind of still make this point that they are still being marginalized. Um, so I guess I just wanted to quickly just end to say, I guess exhibitions need to be seen in this place as opening questions. They're not about answers necessarily, but they're, they're giving us questions to think about. Yeah, I think, it, and as a curator, it feels like one of great responsibility. It would be lovely to call the artist, but it's not always possible anymore to say, would you like to be in this show? How do you feel? And I know that you were mentioning, Abby, that Hepworth was quite apprehensive about discussing her gender, but it's not possible to go back and have that conversation. Um, but certainly, I think one thing that connects all of your presentations is that they all these artists suffered big lulls in their careers when there were no ex not no significant exhibitions going on. So I think we can be certain, as Sarah mentioned, that the role of the exhibition is crucial for visibility, isn't it? Is that is that how that have wanted to know if you wanted to discuss that further, Sarah, really, in terms of that role of the exhibition? Well I think just picking up on what Abby said as well, to see exhibitions as not the final word on a period of time or an artist, but an intervention within history. And I think that's that's particularly um, significant when you have a group show as well, because, you know, I think artists do get sort of pigeonholed or put into groups for various reasons to do with the writing of history. But I think an exhibition can mess that up or, um, you know, reform the networks and the conversations. And it can be like, say, conversations that never happened, you know, between artists from very different time periods as well. Those conversations can be between objects or can be speculative ones. So I do, I like that idea as an exhibition, as a disruptive tool, rather than this kind of rather neat, formal, um, you know, sort of end point of research and the catalogue being that thing as well. You know, I, I like opening it up and saying, actually, it's, maybe this is the start of something and it's provoking a different way. And and I think as well, it's like I was saying, uh, you know, that those interpretations change because new generations of, of, of members of the public meet these artists for the first time, don't they? And they bring their own interpretations and their own subjectivities and concerns to artists. So I think that as well is just a reminder that these histories never remain static. Yeah, and I think that collections have a really important part to play here. The, you know, what I was saying about it not just being an exhibition, but actually there are so many other stories to uncover. And I know that from your previous conversation, Sarah and Bianca, about works being collections, yes, it's great to have a work in a collection, but if that work is rarely seen, and you know it's it's also a sort of invisibility so i hope that through breaking the mold we can start to bring out more stories not just those artists represented in the show i've got a question you know there's some great projects going on we've got kim's show at, at the tay veronica's coming up at spike island the show at the hepworth lots and lots of work going on across this throughout our history in terms of uncovering these artist stories and these wonderful practices do you think we're reaching a more even playing field now uh, you know or, or do, you, do you still feel we've got considerable work to do and it would be good to know also in terms of the public and the commercial sector you know often there's lots going on publicly but what what is going on in the commercial sector in terms of the market values of, of women's work and so on bianca would you like to come come on to that point? so yes optimistically i think we are moving toward a more even playing field um uh, in the sense that every day we're seeing new formulations new new best practice scenarios new expressions of what it means to have gender equality um but and i think i you know i want to say that this is not an emergence occurring in an art in art history alone or any academic discipline it, it's a civil political economic spiritual philosophical global movement um and I think if we consider it from an art historical position, 
gender imbalance and sexism are not isolated conditions, um, and we've all touched upon this as intersectional. So tied up with issues with systemic racism, despite you know um, our post-colonial era biases, discriminations towards sexuality, class, religion, um, and I think overarchingly in the West, the no longer or maybe problematic conceptions of modernism and modernity and nation building that have patterned much of the last century. Um, that being said, you know, I think it still remains the responsibility of museums, galleries, and other collecting and exhibiting bodies that in the public realm to, to, to they, they, re, they remain the most promising space to enact these sort of best practices to support artists and our, our practitioners of all kinds to, to ensure more equal representation. On the commercial side, I think there is this, you know, it's, it's a tricky, it's a tricky thing because the, I think there is, you know, the way that the media functions, the type of headlines that grab attention and clicks are still related to high prices achieved at auctions or elsewhere. And there is a, this, you know, there is a risk of tokenism even within auction houses of women only auctions, for example, which I think are incredibly problematic. Um, and I'm not sure if this will change. So equally, I think we need to, to, to hope for the possibility and, and work towards a possibility of a dialogic relationship between the market and art history. So to move away from art history serving as the handmaiden to the market. And again, I'm betraying my own optimistic and utopian stance here and my, you know, my lived experience of being at an auction house. Um, I think we have to question as well from uh, from a wide from a wide variety of angles you know art history is a discipline so i are there other fields methods and visions that we can bring in from elsewhere and that applies to the marketplace um, what kinds of media and movements would provide for more effective um, mediations between generations between the local and the global between nations between experiences and commercially speaking, can these be leveraged in an ethical way to provide financially for artists and art practitioners? Um, so these are these are kind of key questions that I think about and that we have to address in relation to an even playing field within the marketplace. I guess I could, um, I mean, I don't want to speak on behalf of public collections by any means, but, um, you know, Natalie, of course, as you'll know, I think the national statistic um, for women, I've, I've read it as 12 and 14 percent, so we can we can maybe take it as 13, but it is, you know, the rep representation of women in public collections is 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 very, very low. And, and you know, it's always interesting to ask, like, what is the reparative work happening? Like, is it enough just to kind of, you know, insert more women into collections or do we need to actually be kind of really unpicking like why those collections were built predominantly um in these kind of unequal ways and i think you know those are things that i think about a lot and certainly we talk about at the hepworth regularly in terms of you know what does it mean to be a, a museum representing this legacy of hepworth and and you know it does give us quite a lot of um power i suppose in a way as when we're thinking about acquisitions when you know we're sort of trying to think about how do we really want to not just build you know we also have a, a sort of extraordinary core of modern british uh, from the wakefield art gallery collection that we inherited as well as as hepworth's um uh, from the hepworth family gift so there's there's sort of lots of more conversations i think that need to be had about how acquisitions because you know sort of buying the work of contemporary female black artists for example singularly is is just a tokenistic act in order to kind of tick a box about diversity in our collections and we need to think about how we're doing this strategically and, and in careful ways so that they don't end up sitting in the stores um you know until until something changes we need to think about about how we're displaying them so yeah lots to think about and i, I have no doubt your exhibition will generate a lot of these conversations going forward <laughs> If I could just mention uh, briefly, Natalie, I was going to say it'd be it's interesting if we take that question out of the gallery and onto the street or into the square and think about public sculpture as well. Um, you know, a site of of much uh, you know troubled um, discussion and um, activity recently, and, and uh, Veronica Ryan will be intervening in that sphere because she's been commissioned by uh, the London Borough of Hackney to make one of two sculptures to honour the the Windrush generation. Um, and so it'll be really interesting. She's going to use um, 
the, the forms of fruit from her experiences and memories of uh, the Ridley Road Market to create bronze and marble sculpture and kind of taking, um, I guess, public sculpture away from some of the more figurative uh, monumental traditions, which it can be conventionally associated with, but still using um, you know, the formal and traditional uh, materials of bronze and marble to kind of um, disrupt some of those, um, that, that sort of monumental um, lexicon of, of sculpture. And, and actually just, when you do look at the data of the number of women who are represented in public uh, statues, it's incredibly low. And the number of women who are the makers of those objects, it's also incredibly, incredibly low. So, I mean, I think there's still conversations about representation and especially within public space. And as uh, we were talking about in public collections as well, again, I think those, those conversations are very much related and what kind of interventions within those histories and imagining new futures as well, because I think uh, there's no point looking back if you don't have an eye ahead as well. So I think the, these kind of conversations, these exhibitions and like the commission um, around um, the Spike Island show and the, the, the Hackney monuments will be a really interesting um, crucible in which to explore some of those ideas. Albie Bianca and Sarah, it's been really wonderful to talk to you. I know that we're running out of time, but I think that's a really positive note on which to end with so much to look forward to this year as we return to galleries and public spaces it's going to be so exciting to see some of these wonderful projects in the flesh um, but thank you so much I feel like we could talk for a lot longer um, and hopefully we can do that at another time but thank you for everyone's comments and thank you very much for your contributions have a good evening <laughs>